I'm going to speak uh, somewhat less than the 30 minutes I've been given, although I think at some point you'll have access to the full presentation I prepared. But uh, my uh, colleagues and I agreed that we'd very much like to hear from you and your comments and questions. So we'll cut down, at least to some degree, the length of time uh, for our formal presentations. So let me get started. Uh, when uh, I began four years ago, the book that was mentioned on geoeconomics, uh, it uh, incidentally took me three years, a colleague and myself, three years to, uh, to write it. When I began, uh, I was surprised when I could not find a, a commonly used definition of geoeconomics, even though the word was frequently used in academia, uh, frequently used by politicians, and frequently appeared in the media. But try as I might, I could not find uh, a uh, commonly used definition. So I had to try to figure out, well, what did these people mean by geoeconomics when they used the term? Well, uh, as always in life, many of the people who used the word geoeconomics did not know what they meant by it. <laughs> So we could rule those people out. But uh, after uh, some months, uh, I came to the view uh, that has been mentioned that uh, the best definition for, uh, for geoeconomics, and one that separates it for, from simply international economics, is the use of economic instruments for geopolitical purposes. The use of economic instruments for geopolitical purposes. At the outset, to give you two examples, the recently agreed trade uh, uh, agreement between Jan uh, Japan and the European Union is not a geoeconomic agreement. It is an economic agreement which seeks to improve the wealth and the prosperity of the participating nations, but it does not have a direct connection to the EU or Japan's geopolitical objectives. It's trade for trade's sake. Contrast that with the economic sanctions against North Korea. That's an, another economic instrument, but it is, of course, designed to change North Korea's geopolitical behavior that is its acquisition of nuclear weapons and its uh, acquisition of uh, missiles uh, which threaten uh, both uh, Japan, the region, and uh, perhaps eventually uh, the United States. So that is a geoeconomic uh, instrument which is being applied to the policies of North Korea in a coercive way. And uh, another way to recognize uh, geoeconomic instruments is they are often coercive. They often come with threats. If you do not change your behavior Geopolitically, we will force you to change it 
through economic means. Notice, not military means, but economic means. There are seven economic tools that are suited to geopolitical application that can be used to change the geopolitical policies of a nation. Trade policy, investment policy, economic and financial sanctions, cyber tools, when they're used by a state to steal intellectual property or disrupt economic activity, economic assistance to influence another nation's geopolitical behavior, financial and monetary policy, including efforts to establish currency as a global reserve, and national policies governing energy and commodities, withholding energy and commodities from a nation's acquisition in order to change their geopolitical policies. So those are the seven ways it can be used, and in some cases are being used, as I will describe. Now, geoeconomics, as I've defined it, owes its modern resurgence and application to three factors. The first is that today's rising powers are drawn to economic instruments as their primary means of projecting influence instead of military instruments. The advent of the nuclear age and the fact that most, not all, but most major powers have nuclear weapons has made them very hesitant to begin a war with one another because, of course, of the catastrophic uh, effects of such a war. So they wage combat not through military means, but through geoeconomics. And the same is true of smaller powers. The second reason that geoeconomics have come uh, to the fore are that more states are prone to economic displays of power and have vastly more resources at their direct disposal, including state-owned enterprises. And third, today's markets are deeper, faster, more leveraged, and more integrated than ever before, and thus exert more influence over a nation's foreign policy choices and outcomes. So geoeconomics is now at the forefront of many nations foreign policy. That is true in Asia as I will describe particularly with regard to China but also true in Eurasia. Russia has long practiced geoeconomics, especially using energy as a means to coerce its neighbors, energy supplies. And in the Middle East, you see the Gulf states transferring massive resources to the government of Egypt for geopolitical reasons primarily because it finds the government of Egypt sympathetic to its 
uh, views of regional peace and security. But the major practitioner today of geoeconomics is China. Never in history has one government controlled as much wealth as does China. Notice, I didn't say never has one government been richer than China. That's not true. But one government controlling the wealth, as we know in the United States governments, the government controls very little of the wealth. So never before has one government, government controlled as much wealth. And as its economic might has increased, so too has its ability and temptation to use this power to advance geopolitical ends. This uh, use of economic tools for geopolitical ends allows China to avoid outright military conflict, but to use the strength of its economy for both positive and coercive purposes. There are many examples of this. Uh, Taiwan, of course, is the most obvious uh, example, but uh, China boycotted and restricted trade with South Korea for accepting a U.S. offer to deploy missile defense systems in South Korea. China's Belt Road Initiative means to improve its access to strategic ports and other criti critical infrastructure. And to deal with this Chinese geoeconomic challenge, unfortunately, my country, the United States, has no coherent policies no coherent geoeconomic policies. I say that myself with great regret. Well, what is China trying to do with this, uh, uh, this uh, array of geoeconomic uh, tools? It wishes, in my judgment, to replace the United States as the primary power in Asia. It wishes to weaken the U.S. alliance system in Asia, including, of course, the U.S.-Japan alliance. It seeks to weaken and undermine the confidence of Asian nations in U.S. credibility reliability, and staying power. It wishes to use China's economic power to pull Asian nations closer to Chinese geopolitical preferences. It seeks to use Chinese economic growth to increase China's military capability. It seeks to cast doubt on the U.S. economic model. And all this, of course, while avoiding a military confrontation with the United States. In my view, it is unrealistic to imagine that China's grand strategy, which I've just described, will change in any way, fundamentally, at least in the next decades. Rather, as I said, it, China will seek to systematically diminish American power projection in Asia. 
And although China is undertaking an ambitious program of military modernization, its tools in pursuing these objectives are geoeconomic in character. Now, I could go into great uh, detail, and in fact, uh, the book that was mentioned that uh, I prepared goes into great detail on China's uh, use of these instruments. But uh, I'll only say here at the outset, and we can return to the question uh, uh, in our discussion, which I look forward to, is that uh, its policies at the moment are essentially, its geoeconomic policies, are at the moment generally not resisted in any coherent way by the other countries of, uh, of Asia. And certainly, as I mentioned earlier, not by the United States and not by Europe. So it leaves the uh, nations of Asia vulnerable uh, to uh, this kind of uh, economic uh, coercion. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is uh, the major geoeconomic initiative of China in recent years, has expanded uh, to include most of the world, including the Arctic and Latin America. And let me be clear, some of the pro projects uh, that uh, China is pursuing or will pursue in the Belt Road Initiative are for uh, essentially and most importantly uh, the betterment of the nation to whom the aid is given. But in addition, in the Belt Road Initiative, China has two major geopol geopolitical objectives as opposed to economic objectives. The first is that China acquires the capacity to pressure the recipients of its aid to come to closer identification with China's broad geopolitical purposes. And the second strategic goal, not economic goal, but strategic goal, is to gain strategic assets located at choke points along major trade routes. And they are having some success in both regards. With respect to the second, as you know, or perhaps know, Sri Lanka has signed over the port of Hambantota uh, to China uh, in a 99-year leash. That was a poor investment, economists are almost uh, unanimous in saying, but it was not a poor investment for China's wish to acquire strategic port facilities in South Asia. So uh, this is uh, uh, a phenomenon that is growing in importance, China's geoeconomic policies, and at least so far, uh, as I said earlier, there's a very weak uh, response by uh, like-minded democracies and their partners in Asia. Japan has projected, uh, the figure differs, but something perhaps on the order of $200 billion on alternatives to BRI projects around the world, but so far, uh, and that, that has to do with Vietnam, for example, where Japan is the largest foreign investor, and so forth. But so far, 
uh, Tokyo has not sought to use this assistance directly to promote its geopolitical objectives. Uh, of course, given China's wealth, uh, neither Japan nor any other country can match them uh, uh, project for project, but at least he, uh, Japan has begun the process of thinking about geoeconomics, at least to some degree, and how it might meet this Chinese challenge. India has uh, also uh, proceeded uh, with some geoeconomic uh, instruments, uh, infrastructure investments in Bhutan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, and so forth, but again, inadequate. So as I head for the finish line here, I, I have a simple message, which is that for the foreseeable future, the competition, the geopolitical competition in Asia will be confined to these geoeconomic instruments. It's, in my view, highly unlikely, at least in the next decade, that there will be a military confrontation. China wishes to avoid it. The United States wishes to avoid it. Japan wishes to avoid it. India wishes to avoid it, and so forth. So the combat will be in the economic realm. And it is up to the uh, concerned countries in Asia and uh, across the Pacific, led by the United States, uh, to organize themselves in a way to deal with this uh, salient, uh, uh, salient uh, evolution in the rise of Chinese power. At the moment, we're not doing so. And if that continues, we can expect more and more Asian countries will fall under the coercion of Chinese economic instruments. Thank you.